This gospel passage today is really the center of the Catholic Christian faith. Uh, they call it the Bread of Life Discourse, in which Jesus says, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life, and I will raise him on the last day. Now, at the end of this, a few lines later, it says, Many of them left him over this, because it was a difficult saying. Many of them left him. This is the only place in the New Testament where it says people left him, his disciples left him over a teaching. I don't know about you, but if this is just symbolic, if it's a metaphor, I don't know why people would leave. He said some other stuff that was a little tougher than this, if it's a metaphor. And you can imagine that Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, and they're getting ready to leave, and Peter or somebody says, no, 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 wait, wait, it's just a metaphor. It's, you know, he's not a shepherd either, but he said he's a good shepherd. He's not a vine in the branches, but he said he is. He's not the sheep gate, but he said he was that. And Jesus repeats himself. He says it again. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. Now, when we hear this translated into English, uh, sometimes it sounds like he said the same thing. And he more or less did use different words. The Gospels were written in Greek. And some of you here are probably Greek. Some of you here are associated with Greeks to a certain extent. And so what I'd like to do, I want to read it to you in the Greek and show you the different nuance with respect to the words that are used because this is important for those who would say it's just simply a symbol. He uses it as a symbol of his flesh and blood. Amen, amen, they go to me. Eam e fakte te sarka tu wiu tu antropu kai pinte a tu tuaima uk eke te zoi en autoyas. Ha trogo mo tai sarka now, in the first phrase there, he says, unless you eat, and the word used is foggy. If you know anything about, uh, you know, cells, cell structure biology, phagocytosis is when the cell is essentially eating. So foggy means to eat. In general, just to eat. So he says, unless you eat the flesh, there's two words for flesh. Soma means flesh like a steak, like a, a dead animal. It's a corpse. There's no life there. Or sarks. And sarks is living, breathing, heart beating flesh. And he says here, sark, sarks. So unless you eat the flesh, the living, breathing flesh, and drink his blood, you have no life within you. Now, this is why I think there was some hesitation. The apostle said, wait, wait, he's just he's using a metaphor. Because he changes it in the second phrase. Instead of fogging, which means just generally to eat, he says trogon. Trogon means to munch on, to crunch on, to chew, to digest. It's the physical act of eating. In other words, I'm not making a joke here. I'm not speaking in symbols. I want you to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, to the Jews, this was... No option. Because for the Jew, they had to kosher everything. They believed that the life force of God in Hebrew, the nephesh, was in the blood. So when the blood was emptied out, the animal or human or whatever was dead because there's no nephesh, there's no life force of God. So when they would slaughter an animal, they would empty the blood out on the ground and essentially kosher it. And that way they could eat it. By Jesus saying, eat the flesh of the Son of Man, Jesus, who is also called the Lamb, the Lamb of God, he's saying, take within you the very life presence of God, the nephesh, and that's what we call grace. We receive the body and blood of Christ into us, and that grace is sharing in God's life. It's the nephesh. That's what we celebrate in the Eucharist. People will not die over a metaphor. You know, if, if I have a picture of my nephew, I'm not going to die for that picture of my nephew. I might die for my nephew. I'm not going to die for a picture. And it's so important because the Eucharist is the nourishment we need. Jesus wants us to become what we consume. He wants us to be the body of Christ. St. Paul saying to the Ephesians, cut out all this bad stuff. It's not good for you. It's poisoning you. And take the nourishment that nourishes you. 
things. You've heard the adage, you are what you eat. And Jesus essentially wants us to become the body of Christ. So what's the alternative? Well, you know, Peter will go on to say, where can we go, Lord? You have eternal life. I mean, Jesus will say, we will also leave. Where can we go? We know it's the truth. And scandals are going to come into the church. We see it, uh, I don't know how many of you are from Pennsylvania, but right now we have a terrible scandal in the church. Horrible acts done by certain individuals. And people might be thinking, well, now we just need to leave the church because this is the church. No, this, this is the church. People might say, well, God has a plan. Yeah, God does have a plan, but we ain't following it. And that's the problem. What has happened is, if we do not consume the body of Christ and become that body of Christ, the alternative is filling ourselves with poison. Uh, I know you've probably heard over the last few days about stuff that you feed to your bodies. Remember, we are what we eat. And the things that are bad for you, whether it's drugs, alcohol, whether it's bad junk foods or whatever else. I don't want to talk with you about that today. I want to talk about the garbage we feed to our minds. Because I think that pollutes our souls. And that's what happens. So I want you to think of your favorite food. Your comfort food. If you had a last supper, this would be it. The best food ever. And it could be, yeah, it might not be nourishing for you, but this is just a one-shot deal. So think about your favorite food. For me, it would be chicken livers with white gravy. I know, it's great, isn't it? Um, it's a southern recipe. And yeah, I might die hard for you, but I'll have a small on my It's one meal that you're going to have, your favorite meal. And I guarantee you, a month from now, you're going to be longing for that, whatever it is. So you have this meal that you think of. Now, what if I decided, okay, you mentioned your favorite meal. I will offer you this. I've been saving this garbage for a week. Okay? Looks like a little tomato rotten in there, some old brie, uh, a moldy chicken wing, a coffee filter with coffee in it, some kind of cake thing, whatever. It's garbage. And if it doesn't make, I'm not going to open it up because you probably curl, but if it doesn't make you puke, if it doesn't make you sick, if it doesn't kill you, it's certainly not going to be good for you. And I could take all this garbage, I could try to separate it, I could wash it, maybe airbrush it a little bit to make it look good, and it may seem appealing. It might even taste a little sweet or something. But at best, it's going to make you sick. At worst, it's going to kill you. We would no more eat garbage than we would eat poison. And yet that's what's happening. From the time you're in elementary school, up through high school, and even college, and later on, we see billions of images and messages, so much input from many different platforms that we are consuming. And that necessarily affects us. We can deny it, but it does. Just like putting poison into our body, we might not even notice it. A person eating out of the dumpster is probably going to get sick a few times until their body adjusts, and then they'll be able to stomach it. But they're still going to die you. They're still going to be sick, even if it seems kind of appealing. And so I, I really want to stress, when we get into trouble, when we see scandals like the one that's in the church right now, it's because we have allowed ourselves to consume so much garbage and become so tainted that we, not, we don't look at our brothers and sisters anymore as subjects, which they are. We look at them as objects. A subject is someone who is created for their own good. Someone who has a soul, who has a life, a personality, has joys and sorrows, a history. Someone that God chose to make what he didn't have to. That's a subject. And when we allow our minds to be tainted and poisoned, it changes our vision. So that now we can see someone who is a subject, who should be loved. We can now see them as an object. And we can allow others to see us, who is a subject, and should be loved as an object. It begins to taint us, because it's not healthy for us. As we journey together through this year, I want to assure you 
that what we have here and what we have at the Newman House for your consumption is not what you'll get everywhere else. And I mean that in a little sense and a metaphorical sense. We will feed you better than the cafeteria, but we will also feed you better than many of the places on and off campus. And the truth doesn't always taste good, but it will be healthy. It will nurture us. It will help us to be the people we always hoped we could be. Today we celebrate the body of Christ. Not only that Christ wanted so much to be a part of us that he allows us to consume him, but the body of Christ. We all want the same stuff. We all want to be happy. We all want to be loved. We all want to be successful. Let's do that together. Because whether we're good, consuming good things, or we're consuming bad things, we are what we eat. We will become them. Let us become the people that Christ always hopes.